Good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm Pastor Randy. Uh, many of you I know, most of you I know, some of you I haven't met yet. Uh, some of you I haven't seen in a while or I've met in uh, times past, but it's good to have you here today. We're beginning a new series that we're going to continue on through the next eight weeks. It's called Home is Here. We really do believe that, that, that the church is not just like a home, uh, Jesus' teaching and the entirety of the New Testament leads us to believe that the church really is home, that home is here. And so we'll be talking about that over the next eight weeks. We'll be talking about that on Wednesday night uh, in our community nights when we will be at different tables with eight or ten other people getting to know each other. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be studying that here on Sunday mornings. We'll be praying about that on Tuesday nights. So home is here over the next eight weeks. Uh, this is it. This is the topic. So uh, come with me. Let's go on this journey together. Today is a rather simple, s rather simple message, uh, and it really addresses two different types of people. Uh, and I'm going to guess that most of you fall into these two categories. So today's message really like runs on, on like two tracks, two parallel tracks. Uh, Jesus did that. I'm just, I'm just retelling what Jesus, what Jesus spoke. Uh, two tracks, two types of people. You may be, in fact, you probably are, either the first type of person or the second type of person. This message is for people, uh, the first type of, t type of person uh, is the, 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 the type of person who believes that, that you have really squandered any sort of grace that God might afford you. Like you're a, you're a, you're a class A, uh, screw up, you know, you've done so many bad things in your life that, you know, if we knew, uh, we'd probably laugh you out of this church, right? Like you just feel, all joking aside, you just really struggle with this poor image of your brokenness. And maybe it leads to even to despair uh, at times. Uh, and it leads to a sense of distance between you and God. But this message runs on a second track, and that is uh, it speaks to the person who is religious, uh, you're a churchgoer. I mean, it, it's really, it really, probably most of the people in this room today, uh, you, we fall in this second category. Um, we feel like we've been faithful to God, you know, we, we've, 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 we've done Him a solid you know, we've, we've served, and, and we've, we've given money, and, and we've been faithful to the cause, you know, like loyal to the end. And yet, deep down, there's this, this, this high-grade, or, or, or maybe it's more like a low-grade fever, this, this sense of dissatisfaction with life. And really, within the context of the church, I mean, if I say God is my Father, then, a, then, a, then for me, for those of us who claim to be Christ followers, then, then a dissatisfaction with life is really, when you get right down to it, a dissatisfaction with God. You probably wouldn't say it this way, but you probably have thoughts which when you really, when you really formulate them or when you really um, boil them down might go something like this. Man, God, I... I I've been faithful to you, and, and I, I think I deserve more than what I'm getting out of life. Jesus spent all of his time on earth with these two types of people. Last week, I, I, I said that, that, that I think if Jesus were here um, physically, like still incarnate here on the earth, walking around, that he'd be all about, back to church Sunday, he'd be all about the Home is Here series, and I think he would be all about these two types of people, because these are the people that he, that he sought to be with during his entire life. The first group of people Jesus spent with, hung out with, and what I, mean, what I mean by hung out with, uh, meaning he ate with and he celebrated with 
and he cried with this first group of people, which the the Pharisees, the self-righteous, the religious, would call the sinners. They would say, Jesus Jesus spends all of his time with with sinners. That's what the self-righteous people would say back in the day. But to understand this word, sinners, this classification of sinners, you have to stretch your understanding of the word beyond how we might use the word sinner in 2021 because we're pretty comfortable with saying we're all sinners saved by God's grace. And that would be a true statement. But in that day, when the, when, when, when the Pharisees, when the religious people would say that Jesus hung out with sinners... It was a radical statement. They meant it in an offensive way because sinners in that context meant two types of people. Sinners meant, if you were a sinner in the self-righteous person's mind, it meant that you were either an outcast because of your job description, you're a prostitute or a stripper or a slave trader or a tax collector, which we don't really have. the. You're like a traitor to the nation. You're, 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 you're not safe to be around. In that day, when the self-righteous would say that Jesus hung around with sinners, they either meant they were outcasts because of their job description, like you're a worthless piece of trash because of what you, what you do for a living, or the other, the other type of person that would be thrown into this category would be people that were suffering physically. They were blind. They had muscle diseases or skin diseases that were contagious or sexually transmitted diseases. And and no one wanted to be around them for fear that they might catch what that person has. And, And so Jesus spent his time with sinners in that sense of the word. Those were Jesus' homies. Those were Jesus' friends. All these, all these losers, I'll, I'll put them into that category. That's what the self-righteous meant when they said Jesus spends time with sinners. I mean, Jesus spends time with losers. <clears throat> the other group, the other group that, that Jesus gave his time to were the religious folk, the Pharisees, the self-righteous. And he was pretty hard on them. He, he, would, he would call them out repeatedly. He, he called them, at one point, he called them children of the devil. And these were the churchgoers. These were the religious folk. These were the, these were the people that were funding the, 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 the mission, the cause. And he would, he would call them children of the devil, but honestly, he loved them. And he would, he would go away and, and he would cry for them because they too were harassed. They too were helpless. They too were like sheep without a shepherd. So today we're going to look at a parable. A parable, it's a, it's a story that has a deeper meaning. Jesus used to tell parables frequently. In fact, I, I'm, I'm quite sure there were parables that he told that didn't make it into scriptures because John tells us there were many things that Jesus did and said that didn't even make it into the scriptures. But, but we have some choice parables. A parable would be a, a story intended to teach a deeper meaning. So, today we're looking at this parable and I want to give you the, a feel for the, what the room was like, the context. Here's probably how Jesus told uh, the parable. Most likely, in fact, not more than most likely, definitely, you'll see from the beginning of Scriptures, he, he told this parable t- t- to both groups, to the, the outcasts and the self-righteous who had this deep level of dissatisfaction in God. He told the parable to those who, maybe that's few of us here today, 
those who just felt like they were trash and they were unwanted and they were unwelcome. But he also told it to the, the, uh, the self-righteous who were marked and, and, and maybe if you're, if, you're trying to, if you're looking for a marker, which group do I fall into? They were marked by an angry spirit. The self-righteous in, in, in Jesus, they were marked by an angry spirit. They were angry. Who are they angry at? If you just look at history, if you just read the Bible and you read the other historical books from that day, they were angry at the Roman government. They, they were angry at culture. They were angry at sinners they were angry. They were angry um, at, at 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 other hated uh, ethnic groups and countries. They had a nationalistic aspect to who they are, who they were. They were filled with anger, and yet they were self righteous. And so Jesus, most likely, when he tells this parable, he reclines because that's how they would normally talk. He would recline at a table. He would, he would kick back for dinner. And, and, and the sinners, the, the outcasts, the unclean, the losers, they were, they were, they were there around the table with him because that's who Jesus hung around with. And, and what we know from the story is that perhaps eight feet beyond them, per, perhaps eight feet beyond them are the, 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 the self-righteous standing, wagging their finger in the face of Jesus and the outcasts. So we've got, we've got Jesus around a table of, of outcasts whom he loves, and he's got eight feet away from him standing the self-righteous, the angry folk, whom he also loved. And he tells this story, starting with Luke chapter 15. It says this. It says, Jesus... I'm sorry. Now the tax collectors and the sinners... We're all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes, those are the religious folks, they grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and, and, and eats with them. In other words, he's a sellout, he's a liberal. So, so Jesus told them this parable. Now, he actually told three parables. We're going to skip today to the second parable. It says, a man had two sons. A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, come on, Dad. Give me what's coming my way anyway. He says, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he, the father, distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had, and he traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Let's stop there for a moment. Okay, so what's going on? We've got two sons. We've got a younger son. We've got an older son. The younger son says, Pops, Dad, look, you know you're getting, you're getting up in age. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to get what, uh, what's coming our way sooner or later. Dad, give me the wealth that will eventually be mine anyway. And so the father did so. He gave both sons their inheritance. And not too many days later, the son leaves. He leaves home, and he travels abroad, and he lives recklessly, and he did the things that he said he would never do. Does that sound familiar? Don't, I'm going to want to ask questions today. Don't answer out loud. But does that sound... He did the things that he said he would never do. You know what I mean? You, you ever been there? Like you say, you know, I might, I, might, I might smoke weed, but I'll never be a junkie. I'll never do heroin. You know? Or I, I might flirt, but I'll never cheat. 
I mean, I've got my dignity. I might go so low, but I won't go, I won't, I won't go that low. But then life is long, and you find yourself in your own brokenness, in your own, um, the privacy of your own life, doing the things you said you would never do. And no one may know except you. So the son wastes all his money, I'll speculate a little bit, he wastes all his money on prostitutes and despicable living, and he ends up homeless, and he ends up literally eating out of the trash. Now we're going to skip a few verses. You can check me later and see if that part's true. We're going to skip to verse 17. It says this. When he, the son, came to his senses, if you've got your Bible open, I would, I would suggest you underline that or, you know, if you're sitting here, take a picture of it or something because, because here's the truth that is born out of that one simple statement. It's that, it's that the, the, what we've been told that sin and folly and, 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 and really self-destruction, like that that actually makes sense. It's sensible to go and do those things. And, and really, in God's economy, it doesn't make sense. It's foolishness. And so Jesus chooses, as he makes up this story, because you understand, he's making up this story, but there's a real life story happening right here in front of him with the broken ones and the self-righteous one. He makes up the story, and he decides to say it this way. The younger son, he came to his senses, and he decided to go home. He came to his senses, and he said, the young son... How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, I'll go to my father, and I'll say to him, and then I imagine him practicing this dozens of times on his way home, right? Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. And I bet he practiced that. I bet he wrote it down or he typed it into his notes on his phone. And he, he knew, this is what I'm going to say to my dad. Because I got to, before he, before he kicks me to the curb, thinking that I'm just coming back to be like the son again, I'll be real clear. Dad, I don't want to be the son. I know I can't be your son. I know, I know I've fractured this relationship beyond repair. Maybe you see God in that way. He says, I know that I can't be your son anymore. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. Verse 20. So he got up and he went to his father. But, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He was filled with compassion. And he ran. And he threw his arms around his son or his neck. And he kissed him. He, he kissed his son. Man, the son didn't even get to get a chance to, you know, to, to try out the line that he practiced dozens of times. It, it, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. I've sinned your side. I'm no longer, you know, he's, he's hanging on his neck, but he's still, he's got to say it. I've practiced it. I, no longer will he be called your son, but the father told his slaves, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. Let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost. Now he's found. So they begin to celebrate. All right. Let's stop right there for a moment. So, what we have here is the son comes to his senses, and he goes home to the father. His father's watching the dusty road. He's waiting for this moment. I bet he knows the son's going to eventually come back. And when the son was still far off, he runs out. He gives him a bear hug. The son nervously tries out the speech, but it's no use because he puts a ring on it. Servants don't wear rings. It's a robe and some shoes on his feet. It's not how servants dress, but that's how your son 
dresses. And then the, 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 the father, he says, kill the steer, roast it in the ground, my boy's home. And they threw a party. And the party's just getting started. They're celebrating the young man's return. They fire up the grill. Maybe you did this last night. Maybe you're going to do this today. They fired up the grill in the backyard, and the mariachis start playing. They're having a party. Now, let me remind you, there is another son in this equation. The older son. He had never he'd never walked out. He was he was faithful, at least on the outside, right? He'd, he had never left his 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 father. He had stayed on the family farm. He'd worked for his dad the whole time while his younger brother was out clubbing and partying and wasting his father's fortune and ruining his life and trashing dad's name. I stayed here and worked, he would say. So the older brother in the story, he's out in the field, he's, he's fixing the tractor, or he's cutting the cane, or whatever. And I like to think he hears, like he hears a mariachi, like. He's like, what in the world is that? Or maybe this is your favorite. And he, he knows something's up. I mean, in the story, he, he doesn't yet, he hadn't yet heard the story. He doesn't know what's going on, but he, he, asks, he asks another worker, uh, a servant, an employee, he, a, he asks perhaps a uh, a, a hired a young man. He said, "What? What's going on? What's with the music?" And his fa- and, 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 and the, the son says, "Your dad's throwing a party." Well, what's he throwing a party for? Well, your dad's throwing a party because your younger brother, he returned. He's home. He he walked all the way back, and and your dad's celebrating. Your dad killed a steer. Your dad roasted it in the ground. All your family friends are coming over tonight because your brother has been found. Verse 25 says, verse 25 says this. Now his older, bro- you know, his older son was in the field, and as he came near to the house, he heard music, and he heard dancing. He summoned one of the servants, and he asked what these things meant. He said, your brother is here, he told him. Your father slaughtered the fattened calf because he, ha- uh, because he has him back safe and sound. And verse 28 says, then... The older brother, he became angry. And he didn't want to go in. He didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, Look, look, Dad. I've been slaving many years for you. And I have never disobeyed your orders. Catch the wording here. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Verse 30. But when this son of yours, when this son of yours came who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. He says, you would never even give me a goat to celebrate with, my, with my, my friends, and yet when my lousy brother comes home, you kill the calf for him. Such crazy wording. I, I've got three sons, I've got two daughters, and I've never, ever thought of them as slaves. And yet, and yet that's what the older brother says. I've been slaving these many years for you. And as the parable comes to an end, the, the son never, the older son never comes in, but, 
The, the father makes two profound statements in, these la- in this last verse, verse 31. He says two profound things to the older son. The first, he says, son, son, the father said to, to the older son, son, you are always with me. You're not going anywhere, I'm not going anywhere. Like, you're always with me. And then the second statement that he makes is this, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is found. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Now, I want you to, I want you to um, lean in just a little bit more right now. If you're a, a parent, if you're a child, what's going on? The father, he, he pleads with the older son, just, just come in. Please, son, just, just come on in. But he never came in. He says this, no, I won't come in. I won't eat with that son of yours. You see, the elder son, the elder son's heart had left the father as well long ago. I mean, I suppose he just, he just, didn't, he just didn't have the, the courage to walk away. But it, his heart had wandered long ago. The elder son, it's seen in his desire to have a party with his friends. I just want to have a goat and have a party with my friends. He, he, he had wandered. He had strayed emotionally. He had strayed relationally. He'd stuck around on the farm, perhaps again too, too timid to leave, but he was emotionally just as far off as his younger brother had been. Just didn't have the guts to walk away. Now, let me remind you that there is a context here. Remember the context. Thus ends, thus ends the, the, the telling of the parable. But the story goes on. Because if you remember, the context is this. Jesus, in, in telling this story to, to the, the, uh, the sinners, as they were called, sitting around the table, in fact, the New Living Translation refers to them as the notorious sinners. For some reason, I really like that better. Jesus was sitting with the notorious sinners. They were sharing a meal. This is the context. But as he's telling the story, he's looking right over their heads, uh, right over their heads. He's looking right into the eyes of the religious folk who were perhaps only eight feet away. And in, in telling the story... He, he, he looks into the eyes of the, pre- the precious forgiven sinners, but, but he also speaks right into the hearts of the, the self-righteous Pharisees who are still standing. And he says this, he says, look, all that, all that is the Father's, all that belongs to the Heavenly Father, it, it's yours. All you have to do is sit down at the table. All you have to do is be willing to sit at the table. All you have to do is just be willing to humble yourself. To just be willing to, to, to admit that you have needs. Only then will God step in. And they, they like the elder son in the parable, say, no, I'm better than that. I won't stoop to that level. I have greater knowledge than those people. I've served you longer than these people. I won't eat with sinners. Because honestly, what Jesus is calling us to is that to, to admit, to sit down and, and eat with sinners is to admit that every one of us in this room, we're all unworthy, but we're all welcome at the table. Every one of us, we're all unworthy and we're all welcome at the table. That day in that parable, the young son and the old son, they were really, they really, 
weren't worthy of sitting at the Father's table. But they were welcome. And in that, in that, in that moment, in that moment, I, I, don't, I think I'm being true to the text when I say that. In that moment, I can imagine the sinners sitting at the table with Jesus, you know, like a turkey leg or whatever. You know, I, I hear them, the sinners, the tax collectors, the junkie. I hear them that day saying something like, hey, man, we'll move over. There's room. Like, sit down. Come join us. There's room at the table. We'll move over. We'll scunch. We'll, we'll, we'll scoot over. You just sit down. Plenty of food. Plenty of room. And that should be the message for those of us today who have found healing, forgiveness at the foot of the cross. We should be screaming the same thing with an excited plea. We should be saying, there's room. There's room for more. There's, there's room. There's room at the cross. Come sit down. Let's eat together. Let us find our forgiveness and our healing in, in Christ alone. So we've got these two people, we've got these two lies. One lie is this, I am too bad for God, for God to forgive. I, have, I am beyond saving. And then the other lie really is, ah, God's mercy and grace, it's for me, because I'm not as bad as him. I want us to turn from those lies, both of those lies this morning. They're just doing great damage. So who, whom, to whom do you relate this morning? Do you relate to the sinners who, who have bad reputations, you know? Maybe like how, how, how your old high school buddies know you, you know, your reputation in your hometown growing up. Like a, maybe you just feel like that follows you wherever you go. And Can you relate to these notorious sinners or... or or, or can you relate? Because I think every one of us, we probably need to try and relate to one or the other today. Do you relate to, do you relate to the religious, the self-righteous, dare I say the churchgoer who thinks he or she is better than everyone else and better than the sinners that Jesus chooses to sit down with, to, to make time for? I mean, let me ask you a more pointed question Right now in your life, is there, is there anybody that you're unwilling to sit down at the table with? I, I bet you have good reason. I'm talking, I'm still talking to those of us, like me included, those of us, the religious folk now. Uh, anybody you're unwilling to, I bet you have good reason. Like, I, I won't sit down with that person. We live in the most polarizing, culturally divided time in my life, and it's not, it's not serving the gospel well. If you're part of any, any secondary war going on in the marketplace right now and you're choosing sides and there's people that you're unwilling to sit with, then, man, there's something in this story today for everybody. Okay, so this story that we've read today, it is not a lesson in morality, okay? You understand that? This is not about morality. This is not a lesson about the danger of living recklessly. It's not, that's not what it's about. It's not a lesson about foolishness, although there's, a, there's plenty of foolishness going on in the story. It's not a lesson about foolishness. What is this story about? This is, this is number one, this is a, a lesson of the Father's heart for what is lost and what he rightfully reclaims as his own relationally. It's also about the fact that lostness and separation from the Father makes no sense. There's this, there's this urgent plea, come on home, come to your senses, come on home, home is here, come on home, there, there, there's an urgent plea. It's crazy to stay away, it's crazy to stay away, to stay at a distance from a loving Father. It makes sense to come on home. And in telling this story there are some, of there being something lost, I told you there are actually three parables. I've only told you one of them today. Actually, three parables that he, he, he tells about something being lost. Actually, Jesus is also saying in the telling of the stories, he's speaking of the lostness of the religious folks as well. 
He told another, another very brief story in the book of Matthew. And he said this. He said, so, so here's the story. And by the way, he tells this story. Uh, this is just the end of it. Let, let me tell it first. The, he tells this story to a group of religious, uh, self-righteous, pharisaical sort of people. And he says this. He says, he says to them, he said, now, now to get this, a man has two sons. Different story, but very similar. A man has two sons. And he says to the sons, he says, go work the crops out in the field for me. Go work the crops out in the field for me. And he says, now, now the first son the first son comes to the dad and he says, I will not. I will not go. I will not do what you say. I will not work the crops. But then later he changes his mind and he goes and he, and he, 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 he works the crops. He says, the second son comes to the, the, the father or, 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 or upon the, 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 the instruction of the father. He says, I'll go. I'll go, sir. I'll go, sir. But he doesn't ever go. He says, yeah, I'll go. But he doesn't ever go. And then he says to the, to the, the Pharisees, he says, which which son did the will of the father? Was, which is the obedient son? The one who, who said it never go, but then he rethought he went, or the one who like, said, oh yeah, like, I, I'll do it, dad, but then he never does it. And, and he said, which one? And then, and then they said, I suppose the first one. And this is what he says to them in response. He says, truly I say to you, see if this sounds familiar, the, tra- the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. I think another way of saying it would be that some of us, we're, we're obedient with our lips, but we're not obedient with our hearts. He's saying, Jesus is saying, there's this lostness in religious cultures, yes, even in the church, among those of us who on the outside claim obedience to the Father, but on the inside we dance to a very different song. And Jesus takes that very seriously. So I invite you to respond today in two ways. I invite you to respond today in two ways. Number one, I invite you to come to Jesus. You know, maybe, maybe, that, will be, maybe that will be symbolized. I, I think first it should be a, just a prayer in your heart. Like, I, yeah, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to come on home. I don't want to stray any farther. farther. So it's, it's, a, it's a prayer. It's, not, it's a prayer that you could pray right now. You'd say, I, I trust in who you are, Jesus. I invite you to come to Jesus. Um, but maybe it also looks like maybe it's borne out in you, you come into the table of communion today. We'll, we'll talk more about what the table of communion means. Maybe it means you coming back on Wednesday night for our community nights, for our table groups, and getting to know other Christians and saying, I want to be a part of the family of God. You're welcome here. I invite you, I invite you to, 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 to come to Jesus, to join the party, to... To come out off the porch into the house. Don't, don't stay away like the older son. Come into the house like the younger son. Um, God is actively seeking you. I believe that. God, some of you today, you don't even know why you're here, but, but I believe that God is pursuing you, that God is, is wooing you, that God is finding you. Have you sensed that lately? Don't answer out loud, but have you sensed that lately? Maybe there's something going on in your life. You'd be like, yeah, I feel like God is pursuing me. Last week, we heard a story from uh, a, a young man, David Mata. He, he's only been coming to River Church for about six weeks. And he, 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 had, he had long ago quit on the church. And he, 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 there was a distance. There was a lot going on in his life. But he, he, he told us, and he's told me privately, that, that it, it feels like over the summer God was pursuing him. God was drawing him. God was, and, and, he's, and, and if you didn't hear the story, it's kind of funny. There's a... Pokemon Go, I don't know, something like a laser beam or something, I don't know. Right out here, what's it called? A stop. There you go. A Pokemon stop right out here in Guad. (laughs) I brought David Mata to River Church through a Pokemon Go stop. Go stop? Is that how you say it? Um, 
Yeah, okay. Uh, so anyway, maybe, maybe in some weird, seemingly coincidental way, God has been pursuing you, drawing you. Maybe today is the day where you say, I'm going to come to my senses. I, I'm going to I'm going to lean in. I want to follow Jesus. I believe that God wants to hold a party over your return. To use some, some phrases that come right out of Scripture, He wants to, God wants to clothe you in righteousness. God wants to dance over you with delight. God is filled with compassion for you. First response today is I would, I would invite you to come to Jesus. That's for every one of us. The second response that I would invite you to today, and this is, this is especially for those of us that have been at it for a while. The religious, let's just admit it to some degree, the self-righteous. I invite you to a renewed dependence on God for your satisfaction. The older brother's words, listen to them. They reveal his heart. Listen to his heart. Look, these many years I have served you, I have never disobeyed your command, and yet you don't even give me a go. It's this deep dissatisfaction that maybe you feel you've never, you haven't left, you're still hanging around, but just a deep sense of God owes me more. But you've lost any sense of delight in being with the Father. You live under His roof. Um, but, but there's no enjoyment of the satisfying pleasure of the presence of God in your life. It's just like, like two separate, two strangers living under the same roof. You know, satisfaction, you know this if you're a parent, satisfaction is the highest act of praise in the life of a child. Let me say that again. Let me say it again. Satisfaction is the highest act of praise in the life of a child. As a, as a dad, I know that. Nothing, <laughs> nothing makes me look better, better than when my children, you know, aren't just like, well, well fed and well dressed, but when they're just deeply satisfied, like there's just a sense of happiness in life. You know, we all go through stuff, right? Um, but, but when my kids are, are satisfied, it's, 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 it's something that you, you can relate, something that sometimes is just, it's so unsettling when you feel like your kids, like they're, you know, they're, they're bored and they don't like what's for dinner and they wish you'd buy them a new pair of kicks and they like they're just this because it just makes me look bad but when my kids are, are satisfied with whatever I'm able according to my means to give them when they're satisfied man it just makes me look good you know your the heavenly father our relationship with him is just like that when Christians run around dissatisfied and, and angry and, and unsettled and just wondering like I don't know what's gonna happen next it just makes God look terrible. Some of us, we've been out for a long time, but we've just lost our joy. We no longer cherish our Heavenly Father's closeness. What's born out of that? And attitudes of anger. You see it in the story. Attitudes of judgment. Attitudes of, I deserve more. And, and, and in, in closing, what does the dad say to the, to the older son? It is, I believe, what Jesus is saying to the self-righteous that day. It is what I believe God is saying to us, yea, to me today. The words of the dad in the parable, he says, hey, son, all that I have is yours. Rest in that. The, the fact that I'm gracing your, your little brother and killed a, throwing a party for him, 
Rest in the fact that all that I have is yours. I, I, think, I think some of us are running a race so hard, trying to find our own satisfaction and tack on religion. And God says, lay that race down. Rest in my goodness. In God's economy, we use that phrase around here all the time. In God's economy, what we believe as Christ's followers in God's economy is that we've got this little bitty life of like 70, 80, 90 years. I'm, uh, I'm getting closer now, so I'm going to say 90 or 100 years. Uh, and, and, uh, but that's just like, a, just like a, a moment in time. But then in God's economy, we have eternity with the Father. And what he says to you today is rest in the fact that all that I have is yours for eternity. I invite you to, to find your satisfaction in God today. The church is home. The church is where the children of God belong. Wel- welcome home. Home is here. God, God has sought you out to save you. He rejoices in you. He he dances over you. Every one of you. Rest in that. Let's pray.